Hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Um, I'm Jill Stoker, and I'm the editor of the Mary Evans Poems and Pictures blog, uh, which tonight's 15 poems by 15 poets have been taken from. Uh, the blog was launched on National Poetry Day in October 2015. And um, we would never have got started, really, without the help of a local group of poets based in Greenwich, southeast London, the Nevada Street poets, who wrote poems in response to some of the images on our website. And uh, I know she's here tonight, so I'd especially like to thank Lorraine Mariner for her help in those early days. Uh, she was one of the first poets to contribute, along with Sarah Westcott, who's also who's reading tonight. Uh, two other early contributors also reading tonight were Jill Sharp and Richard Westcott. Uh, so my plan for the blog uh, from the start was to add a poem picture combination on a weekly basis. And we've been able to stick to that over the years, the past five years or so, including during the recent three lockdowns, thanks to remote working. Um, I've lost count of how many poems are on the blog, but uh, having consulted my magic spreadsheet, I can confirm that we currently have 130 contributors, poets to the blog, and several of those 130 have contributed more than one poem each. Um, we've held two face-to-face -face events in the past, both in Greenwich, hosted by Irena Hill, who is also with us tonight, Irena of Inwards, um, in October 2017, the first event, we celebrated the blog's second birthday with a reading by 12 poets. And then in April 2019, we had a poetry book launch for Jane Clark, who's with us tonight too, uh, with a, a book called All the Way Home, which was published by Smith Doorstop. Uh, poems written specially by Jane in response to an archive of World War I photos, the Patricia Aubrey collection represented by Mary Evans. So that's a little potted history of the blog. Um, any poets out there who haven't yet contributed, please get in touch. We're always happy to hear from you. Um, so before we move on to our poets and the main business of the evening, I'd like to thank Alison and Mark at Arts Destination South Malton and their team for very kindly hosting this event, um, helping to publicize it and handling all the technical wizardry and zoomery. Um, Alison tells me that we have a great audience tonight, not only from within the UK, but from places as far afield as France, Spain, Sweden, Canada, and the USA. And I've also invited some contacts from in Italy and even the frosty Caucasus in Russia. So I hope they've met, both managed to log in too. Um, so just to mention just a little technical point, uh, we'll all be muted for the event to avoid noises off, uh, but the chat facility is available for everyone to post comments and questions, so please use it and Alison will chair a brief Q&A session towards the end of the event, which we think will finish at around 7.30. So that's quite enough from me, except to say a very big thank you to our 15 wonderful poets who've agreed to be here with us tonight and read their poems. So now I'd like to hand over to our first poet of the evening, Jill Sharp. Over to you, Jill. Thank you, Jill. 
Thank you very much. I'm just unmuting myself here. Um, it's lovely to be taking part in this reading. And because we're friends and former OU colleagues, I've followed the progress of the blog from its very beginning. And it's been fantastic to see the way in which it's become a wonderful showcase for the Mary Evans images, as well as for the poems that they've inspired. So the poem I'm going to read this evening was prompted by this image at a time when I was just discovering the poetry of Gertrude Stein and feeling quite shocked and astonished by the way she shakes up the language. And then coincidentally, a storm was wreaking havoc across the UK, but it was given the name Gertrude. So I couldn't resist the temptation to write about the storm as a pastiche of her style. Um, I've discovered actually in preparing for this that it's not easy to read aloud. So, Storm Gertrude. It was a very, it was, it was very, gusts of up to, to up to here, homes without power, bridges shut, shut, shutter shut, and so shutter, so shut, wind, windy night, more prudent not to, not not to venture, to not venture out, can cancelled, not flight, no flying, not flight, is considerable, what, what is what, what, which is what, warnings, worst hit by them, frequent and so, brought down in the heavy trees, and the trees, trees windy down so. Thank you. And now I'd like to welcome our next poet, Jane Clark. Uh, thanks very much, Jill. And uh, thanks also to Jill and Alison and Mark. It's great to be here tonight. I'm uh, in Wicklow in Ireland and uh, it's very uh, wild and stormy outside. Uh, so uh, Jill, your poem is a perfect one to follow. Uh, and I loved the way your lines and the way you worked with the words to evoke the power of the storm. I think it works really well, fabulous. So um, the poem, you can see the image there uh, for the poem I'm going to read. The image is that of couch grass. It's actually a beautiful lithograph from 1887. And I love the, the kind of, you know, the scientific accuracy and yet the beauty of this image. Um, I use the metaphor of couch grass in this poem, which is actually from my second collection, When the Tree Falls. And the poem is um, about cancer and metastasis, and it's part of a sequence uh, for a friend, a friend of mine, another poet, Shirley McClure. Metastasis. The way couch grass takes hold of a garden, spreads seeds, runners, white rhizomes, long before we notice. The way it grows more tenacious when we begin to dig, gathering different names, dog grass, scotch grass, quick grass, twitch grass. The way it creeps along the ground, then sends a root deep down, slips silent under fences, colonizes beds and gets itself entangled through Agapanthus midnight blue. The way that it persists, the way that it persists. Um, so thank you. And I'd like to hand over now to the next poet, Rebecca Gettin. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for that wonderful poem about couch grass. I love grasses and I'd like to know more about them. And your poem was just so moving with its connection with cancer. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for having me, having, reading a poem. I'm very honored to be here. Um, so my poem uh, is about this picture that you now see on the screen and this photo jumped out at me because it reminds me of how farms used to look when I was a child in Yorkshire. Um, a scattering of hens, a messy place, some sheep in the background. Um, but there was 
around here on Dartmoor, where I live, there was once a really interesting junkyard and, well, a scrapyard, and it was full of life and everybody came along and recycled bits of cars. And then the planners got hold of it and closed it down. And it had been there for generations. So it was once, a, this place was once a hive of activity. And now it's been smartened up and it's all holiday lets. So that's why I liked this picture. And I called the poem Steering. Who needs a road? I can reach so many more places without one. The broody hens and their eggs are already aboard as I grasp the wheel to propel them far over the hills and away. I can't see through the windscreen, but with my feet on the ground, there's no need to know what lies behind. I can hatch any future. And now, thank you for listening. I'll hand over to Rosie Jackson. Thank you, Rebecca. That was really wonderful. I didn't realize, Rebecca, we both came from Yorkshire. Um, and uh, I too am in Devon, like Rebecca, but uh, I'm on the other side of Dartmoor, on the West Wet side. Um, I write a lot in response to images and art. Um, and recently I wrote a book about uh, Stanley Spencer's art. And um, I also write a lot about death and what we imagine will come after. And this poem is about being ferried across the river that leads to the next life. I was drawn to this image because it deals with this theme. Uh, I had already started the poem when I found the image, but it does uh, respond to it as well. And the poem refers to some of the traditional practices associated with dying, such as laying coins on the tongue, whether to appease the gods or pay the ferryman. And I think the poem fits this image well. This is a painted tombstone from southern Italy from about 350 BC. And it seems to show a noble woman being helped to climb into the boat steered by the angel of death. And um, I think with so many deaths and losses right now, it's perhaps a stark reminder of what we will all have to face one day and the things we will have to relinquish. <clears throat> the ferryman. You can spit out the coins love laid so carefully upon your tongue. Forget your hampers, cherries, furtive ladybirds. This man will take no bribes, no coded messages. His job is to steal you away from shoreline and kisses. With each push of the skiff, you grow less, no less. And when you throw your wedding ring overboard, you can't recall what those, white what those white circles on your fingers mean. And now the last necessity, language itself starts to fall away, shaken from a cloth of sky which spills out stars, sonnets, sentences. Perhaps you wait in the long silence for that somewhere better you have always dreamed of lived for. But the ferryman, he of the hooked nose, steers you to marshes where you must relinquish all your thought of heaven and let everything go. Everything. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry I forgot to say how wonderful I found Rebecca's poem. It was the first time I'd heard it and I was nervous and I forgot to say it was really lovely, Rebecca. Thank you. And now I'll pass over to the equally wonderful Janet Sutherland. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, and um, thanks, Rosie. Um, I love the way that Rosie's poem catalogues the gradual losses of death so exquisitely um, from the items that we use whilst we're alive. 
to relationships, language, and finally, thought itself. Um, my poem um, is called Tracks and Pathways, and it's a piece in two parts. Both parts are about pathways. The first is in countryside, the second is on the body. The first part acts as a reminder of something that happened in childhood at primary school in the girls' toilets. The poem opens on a chalk rise on the South Downs, um, and that's where I live. I live uh, near Lewis um, on the South Downs um, on a snowy day. A track runs down the landscape where the snow gathers, loosens and gives way. Um, and then the, the image is from um, a photograph taken in 1909 um, by Reginald Mulby, who was a pioneer photographer and the official photographer to the Royal Horticultural Society. Uh, and the image um, shows a black and white photograph of snow covered umbelliferous plants against a cloudy sky. And I chose the image because it shows snow revealing just parts of the plants as in the first trackway in the poem and how the plants in the photo seem to be rising up to be transformed into clouds. So here's the poem, Tracks and Pathways. This old chalk rise is not entirely free of blemishes. A slight track runs down the length of its belly where snow gathers, loosens and gives way. Still mostly covered, it eases from blackthorn, laid grasses, nettle. Your belly, was once a path in snow. That summer, just before the bell, we clattered in, the two of us, alone. And from the next door cubicle, I sang your name to strike the echoes from the walls, while you, ahead of me in all such things, slid your cold finger down that centre line. And, um, So now it's, um, it's a great pleasure to hand over to Martin Crucifix. Hello. Hello, am I on? Yes, it, it's your turn, Martin. We're right. looking for Sorry, the hearing. The, in the internet went down just at that very moment. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. And Janet, that meant I, I missed part of your poem, I think. I was going to say I love the I think the poem's from your collection, Home Farm, isn't it? Which has got lots of chalky landscapes in. Um, and I love the chalky landscapes of, of Wiltshire, which is where I was brought up. Um, so my poem, uh, a couple of years ago, I ran a, a writing workshop at the Holborn Museum in Bath. And we were looking at um, images by Peter Bruegel and this image, uh, the poem I'm reading this evening is, is from this image by Bruegel. The um, as William Carlos Williams also felt Bruegel kind of offers a lot of encouragement, I think, to write poems from his images. Uh, we, I think we kind of respond to, to what seems to be a, a plain unvarnished version of the truth um, in our modern view. His, his perspective seems sort of democratic or demotic. And he likes also 
um, he's eccentric in, in the true meaning of the word in that he displaces what, what you'd expect to be at the center of the canvas off to one side often. And he's doing that a little bit here. You can see at the back Joseph being whispered to by, by somebody. And even Mary, although she's put into the middle of the canvas, she's all sort of downcast eyes and, and hooded and self-deprecating as if she didn't really want to be there at all. And I followed in the poem, I follow that kind of example. And I, I picked, if you can see him, there's a bespectacled figure up on the top right, just behind um, one of the kings there, and he's he's looking in. And he speaks my poem, and I take it from the spectacles that he's his sight isn't very good. Um, he he hardly knows, I think, what he's seeing. He's skeptical about it, maybe even a bit suspicious about what all this kerfuffle in in the village might mean. The Adoration of the Kings. Everything looks rough-hewn and doltish and has done since my eyes began to betray me. Unreliably now I peer through thick blue saucers of glass, yet feel how these strangers stir us. This one with the pinched face of a carpenter more than king though the bold red of his sleeves and collar and aureate bowl his fingers dandle appear to be rich indeed and wholly out of place in our stable yard. Where we find this squalling child, reluctant and bollock naked as far as I see, then this older one with his lank grey hair stooping as if to show off his ermine trim and his extraordinarily long pink sleeves. I see them more clearly than anything else. He positions his hat and mace in the dirt to offer something I can't make out. Beside me, the black skin and sharp leather smell of the third, who proffers an elaborate gift of green and yellow. It must be gold and jade, yet smells sweetly of spices to me, a sort of sweetness like nothing I've known. And I can tell you, I'm good with odors, even better with my ears, which are sharp enough to trace the munching commentary of the ass in the byre, the shifting of the crowd and the hiss of doltish peat with his lips to the poor father's ear, telling him, I suppose, what we all know of the difference in their ages and the ominous signs from the fractious boy, even the fact the child cannot possibly be his. Shit for brains, Pete, in his green snood has never been one to look beyond the obvious, not one to let gossip go a-begging. Yet the mother's face is turned now, half obscured, as if she wants us to believe there is something in all this, not the sighted nor the blind can fathom, some secret she and her strangers are keeping. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand on now to the wonderful Alison Hill. Thank you very much, Martin, and uh, what a wonderfully rich poem. Um, I was looking at the painting earlier and you just brought out so many layers and so many different layers of meaning that I think that poem really needs to be read a few times to peel back the paint and the actual meaning. So thank you very much for that. And thank you, um, Jill, for inviting me to read here. I'm very glad to have three poems on the blog. Um, and this particular one, um, leapt out at me, mainly because it has the word Spitfire and Hurricane in there. And it resonates with my recent collection of Sisters and Spitfires, which celebrated the lives and the, and the flights of the, the women who flew in the um, uh, ATA during Second World War. Um, some of you might have seen that the last surviving pilot died recently aged 103. 
an amazing crowd of women, just as equally interesting as this, this group of people on the picture, um, all with a story to tell. But for this group and this purpose, um, taken in 1940, they had a message, and it was this message that came into the poem. You can do without most things, declared the women with designs on our spare aluminium. How many soup pans do you need? Delve deep in your cupboards, donate to the cause. Learn the art of one pot meals, placating the men who still demand their roast and two veg. All scarce now, anyway. Train them to appreciate a simple palate. One pan less won't hurt. Imagine crushed silver beneath your feet, the shiver and scrape of metallic plunge. Spits and hurricanes flying formation on kitchen fuel. So bang on your lids, bring out your pots and pans, shoulder the weight of old familiar buildings fallen in the night. The silent weeping of those left behind. I'd like to introduce now um, our next poet, Richard Westcott. Thank you, Alison, that was very moving. We can all do perhaps with one pan less. Um, we go from the Second World War now to the First World War. Um, and we remain actually focused on planes. I can't remember how I stumbled upon it, but this image flew straight at me. It's a picture card. Um, it was included free with Liebig products. Liebig made meat extracts like Oxo. The cards were lavishly produced. They were designed to be collected, usually in sets of six. Um, and included in the bottom right hand corner, uh, there is the hero's portrait. Willie Coppins, Willie Coppins, he learned to fly in eight weeks in Britain at his own expense in 1915 to become an air ace and eventually and perhaps inevitably he was badly injured. He was exceedingly um, profusely decorated. He had medals from seven nations. I can't help but admire this, uh, this brave, dashing, smiling fellow in his flimsy flying machine. It's really a suitable subject to be sure, but for a free card, which are actually now very valuable, but at the same time, I'm very conscious of the uh, shocking glorification, the almost trivialization of this aerial violence, which links his heroism to meat extract cubes which are indeed bien meilleur, much better, with an exclamation mark. Here's the poem. Les gloires de l'aviation militaire belge. Willy grins, safe in his bubble, while all around the clouds explode, as if all this were nothing at all to do with him. Improbably, a grey balloon deflates in flames Bien meilleur, the sky is full of drum. 35 of them, I read. That's quite a bag. No wonder he is smiling. His biplane banks, the pram wheels spin. He's off to find another. Reproduction interdite. You must not try to do this too, but should you wish to find out more, just look behind, explication au Thank you. Um, it's now my very great pleasure to hand over to the next poet who happens to be my daughter, Sarah. And I think you'll find she is going to keep you in the sky as well. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Alison. Um, Hello, everybody. Thank you, Richard. Yes. Um, I found it really interesting how you brought the life out of that picture card um, over a hundred years later. Um, so just continuing the aerial theme in the last few poems, um, this is a photo um, taken from an aeroplane, obviously of clouds from above, although they could almost be from below as well when you look at the really high ones. And um, I was inspired by um, thinking about how it feels when you first see clouds when you're in a plane and that sense that they look very much like matter um, 
and what might happen if you actually jumped into them and could they support you? Um, so this is a poem that explores clouds and actually it's a love poem as well. It's quite short, it's a sonnet and it's addressed to a loved one and it's really about the nature of love seen through clouds and it's called Flight. If love was like clouds and I leapt from the plane, could I fall into you? Could you bear me softly like faith? Must my shadow with woolly devotion fold me into your core where I could not feel the rush of grave air? Would you blind me temporarily, please? Let me glean this when I unbuckle head for the exit. Your turning mass like milk in the belly your lack of certainty, the way your edges fell. Or let me make my own cloud, here on the pane. Let me hush you into an oval window, wipe a line through my breath with a finger, as if proving I have agency over love and water and air. Thank you. So now I'm going to hand over to the rather wonderful poet, uh, Robert, Robin Houghton. Thank you, Sarah. That was uh, such a lovely evocation of the, the metaphorical leap into love that, uh, that we have to do. Although you don't actually leap at the end of the poem, do you, interestingly? Um, greetings, everybody from Eastbourne on the South Coast. It's lovely to be here. The picture that inspired me was this illustration from the, the White Star Line brochure of 1912. And it was basically a brochure advertising the Titanic. So if you had the, the money to pay for a first class ticket on the Titanic, you could look forward to swimming in the swimming pool that was uh, inside the ship. And I looked at this image of these carefree ladies about to take the plunge and the rather sad irony of swimming on the Titanic and without really knowing what was gonna come, what kind of swimming they were gonna be doing very soon. This is called Ladies Hour. It's good for the bust just a gentle stretch or two, then small steps in. It's warmer than you think. It's deeper than you think. I love the blue fear of this, down, down, watching my leg disappear and the other, up to my waist, my neck, that's it. Between me and the sea, just a smell of steerage, the low belly of boat, the swell. It's good for the bust. I will do this. Reach forward, take a breath. I believe I will float, I will glide, just to push with my foot, my little foot, and let go. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to hand over to the next poet, Vivian Freeman. Hello. Thank you so much, Robin, for that poignant poem, full of atmosphere and character. And hello, everyone. It's lovely to be here. The poem I shall read tonight, called Skating Alone, was written by the hero of my latest novel, The Escape of Rose Alley. Here it is. Set in 1900. Leonard Pritchard runs a bookshop cru crucial to the plot and he writes poetry, which is ahead of its time. Although the poem from the picture library comes from the 1950s, I chose it because I think that there is something archetypal and timeless about a solo figure on the ice. Skating alone. 
The clean cut of my blades through the ice pleases my ear and makes a thin powder beside the two parallel lines which I see as I curve automatically into a figure of eight. I admire the motif, repeat it again and again, until the emotion released cools in the mist of my breath. This frozen lake is grey like the sky, except where my skates slice, leaving their trail with its ruffle of fondant adjacent. Far away at the margin, trees blossom with snow, dots moving under them, muted. No sound can I hear but of my own making, leaning into the lunges, or should I say slides, quickly now, as I follow the impulse to glide on down the river. What if I follow my wind? Let it take me on to the sea. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Derek Sellen. Thank you, Vivian. Um, what, a, what a great idea to draw out of that photograph, the idea of skating down the river all the way to the sea. That, that's a fantastic way to end the poem. Um, as you can see from the, the image, uh, my poem is about the wild plant ragwort and um, a few years ago um, I was watching my daughter and her partner clearing their small holding of ragwort they just bought it and it was an exceptionally arduous job um, ragwort uh, has a reputation of uh, poisoning horses uh, and there are other reasons for removing it um, I didn't know much about ragwort at that time but um, since then, I, I've come to ad rather admire it and to look out for it uh, when it's flowering and uh, to respect it. And certainly, um, I hope the poem shows respect for ragwort. Um, so this poem matches the image on your screen. And the poem is actually in the voice of the plant. Ragwort. You may call me what you like. Stinking willy, mare's fart, canker wort, but I am no smelly mongrel. I am St. James's flower with my 13 petals and my golden heart. My stems are smooth and hairless, a climbing frame for bronze caterpillars. The cinnabar and the knot horn are my moths. Touch me and I will sting you. Yank me and I will have the stronger grip. Yes, I am noxious, an injurious weed, not easily broken. I seize acres, I poison horses and cattle that crop me, fumble at my roots in heavy duty gloves, lever me out with spades, burn me as you like. My seeds lie deep and wide, beyond the reach of control orders. I am a tough foe. I hold my piece of earth. And I would now like to, like to hand over to Chris Hardy. Thank you, Derek. Um, a clever, incisive poem about that vigorous plant loved by insects and feared by farmers. Um, about my poem, while looking through the wonderful picture library, I came across some images of clocks and barometers and I'd just been given an old barometer that wasn't working. Hi, um, John, really sorry, it's Chris now, not you. <laughs> yeah, I know it is. Shall I continue? Yeah. We're, we're okay, Alison. We have Chris yeah. on the screen now. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Right. About my poem, while looking through this wonderful picture library, um, I came across some images of clocks and barometers, and I'd just been given an old barometer that wasn't working. This led me to discover many things about mercury, quicksilver, 
and the delicate, complicated mechanism by which a barometer, these old barometers especially, measures and displays the weather. Forecasting the present. I notice it every time, one hand stuck on fair through winter, summer. George III, M. Waller, Vernier Scale, Detachable Hygrometer. Silent moon face in the corridor, glanced at, tapped, should blink and elegantly explain the weather in the window. But the mercury, once liquid in its tall, thin tube, is black and stuck, insisting climate does not change. I'll get it fixed. I like to know what's happening. Turn the wheel so one hand marks where the level rests beneath Earth's tidal air, full of swift quicksilver shoals this afternoon. Tomorrow, it will recall where we were, and its companion, tugged by a thread, will say, if we slid down or climbed up from yesterday. Now I'll hand over to John Freeman's Swallows. Hello, everybody, and uh, sorry for that slight snafu just now. Uh, and thank you, Chris. I love the way your poem so um, beautifully evokes the barometer with so much affection and moves from the mercury in it and all those lovely technical words you use to the from mercury in the barometer turned black to the quicksilver shoals of the air. So from indoors to outdoors and from the 18th century to climate change denial, um, very topical. My poem describes a country walk at a time when I lived in the city of Cardiff and had to go to the nearest park to see so much as a sparrow. I now live in a village in the Vale of Glamorgan, which uh, where I see swallows more often, I'm glad to say. I was staying with friends in Somerset and it was that time of year when if you dress for the morning weather, you'll be lugging surplus clothing around later. What I like about the image from the picture library is that it gives you a full clear view of what in the poem and indeed in life is often only glimpsed. Swallows. Cool morning, scorching afternoon. A walk through yellow fields, now across this farmyard. On one side of the path in the air, a twitch, a flicker, then another flicker, winking in and out of gaping semi-darkness. I step aside under a towering doorway. Up there in the gloom among the rafters, a concentration of blackness is stirring around a bubbling center of dark life. Back at the bright entrance, there are four, five, six chances to unriddle the sudden blur, the curving wings, forked tail, flashes of white, snipping sounds like a busy hairdresser's. I blunder back out into the daylight, daylight and rejoin my companions where the path opens on a deserted lane. Above us, on telegraph wires in swags over a hedge, a row of them seem queuing to be admired, silhouetting on blue their slinky grace. Then there are cream teas in a farm garden, while at the periphery of vision, shadows are swooping against walls and beyond living shapes transforming wires to staves, whispering their music into the darkness of memory, like a nest high in a barn they will return to summer after summer, into which from the paths of careful thought, I will step aside to be astonished again as they explode out of nowhere past me to the dazzling summer sunshine. It gives me 
great pleasure to hand over to, last but not least, Rosie Johnston. Thank you very much, John. I love the way you use layered imagery like that. I'm particularly taken by um, among the rafters, a concentration of blackness is stirring around a bubbling center of dark life. And then you bring us back, it, back at the bright entrance, there are four, five, six chances to unriddle the sudden blur, just brilliant, love it, magical writing, thank you. Hello, yes, I'm Rosie Johnston and I live in Whitstable on the north coast of Kent, poor old Kent. <laughs> uh, Whitstable is famous for its oysters. Shells of Whitstable native oysters turned up in Rome when the Colosseum was excavated in the 19th century and then again under Mussolini in the 20th. I've often wondered how those oysters made it live all the way to Rome in those days. For me, this picture sums up just such a lot of Whitstable. Eating with friends in one of the restaurants here or just with a bottle and a plate of seafood on the beach, watching the sun go down. Those days will come again. They will. So here is Oyster 17s. I hope it warms your cockles. Sapphires in a hurry flutter. Two dozen starlings rush to Sheppy. Seaweed garlands roll on the high tide, full moon's tangle of jet and jade. The sea cradles me, my best mother. I roll and kick like a baby. Ripples brush your naked shoulder, a sibilance, a sparrow's whisper. My skin dulled under hospital lights exults in blustery sunshine. Twilight wraps blankets of crimson glory around this evening's shoulders. Sky is honeyed mango slivers, dark rum soaked with pomegranate seeds. Laughter waltzes with garlic prawns, jives with olives, pirouettes with wine. Between the bowls and candlelight stretch moments of perfect contentment. Low tide takes its muted leave, soft pools marooned while oyster catchers play. Whitstable harbour of tangible happiness, peace glides into dock. Where sea and sky merge in a thousand pinks aligns the mind's horizon. This fresh day, let's shuck it open, feel gusto pour between our fingers. Thank you for listening. Now with very many thanks to Jill for her wonderful blog and to everyone behind this marvelous event, I have to hand back to Alison, thank you. Hello everybody and uh, a very warm welcome to you all. Later on we're going to have some questions and answers between you the participants and our wonderful poets. Please put your questions in the box and I will read them out and address them to the poets. So having asked you to do that I'm now going to turn to my main job of the evening, which is to say thank you to everyone for coming this evening to this lovely evening, to the 15 poets who've read such, and indeed written, such a wonderful range of poems from fair weather and foul, to cooking and taste, to medicinal metaphors, to daring do, to journeys through the past, love and the imagination, from high to low, from birth to death, exciting the ear, the eye, our feelings including animate and inanimate objects with a little touch of humour on the way. 
As Rosie, our last poet, said, I hope it warms your cockles, our lovely evening. Could we please now show our appreciation in the time-honoured fashion, except in silence. But if you clap very vigorously, you will be seen. So let's thank our wonderful poets and our wonderful Jill Stoker, whose idea this was and who has made this evening possible. Okay, I'm still on, I think. Yep. Okay, um, well, I've got very many questions in the box except for my own, um, because I thought I'd better prepare for um, this. Um, so, before I get to the questions, because I'm just, yeah, they're all mine, I'm afraid. Please, please put your questions in the box. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank um, Jill again, and I'd like to thank Mark Cornelius, who is ASDM's Arts Destination South Moulton. Look us up on Facebook. He is Mr. Techie. So many thanks, Mark, for doing such a fabulous job, which I, on what I would know was a very complicated evening. Um, okay, I'm going to do the questions that we've had. And uh, perhaps if we get some more in the box, I can read them out. Uh, Jane, I was fascinated by your metaphor of the couch grass. And I wonder, could you please tell us where that or how that metaphor came to you? Thank you, Jane. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, Alison, and thanks for the way you linked all our poems so beautifully there. It was really lovely. Um, yes, well, when when we moved to live in Wicklow, which is about, oh, I don't know, 25 years ago or something now, but uh, we were, I had to dig out the garden and dig out so much couch grass. <laughs> and it's still, it's, you know, it appears every year. So, you know, when I was... You know, my friend was very ill, her cancer had metastasized, and it was that sense of something, uh, you know, that, that was going everywhere and couldn't be stopped. And that sense of it, you know, the, the kind of the viciousness of, of when cancer metastasizes. And it, you know, it just gave me, it, it sort of helped me write about something I wanted to write about. And, but also it was interesting when I wrote it, it started off, I was just so angry and then it moved towards the sadness and kind of the beauty of Agapanthus towards the end. And I mean, maybe just to say that the drawing, you know, the botanical drawing, the image that went with mm -hmm. it, my, my friend's grandmother actually did those kind of botanical drawings. So it felt very appropriate to put them together, uh, even though, um, you know, my friend has died, so she won't see them put together but uh, I like that they are put together like that. A way of remembering her forever in a sense yes. isn't it making her eternal. Yeah. Okay, thank you very yeah. much for that Jane. The next question comes from Jill Stoker um, and I think it needs to go to Rosie Johnston. If I've got the right Rosie, the one who was not at the end. I'm sorry I've forgotten. Um, oh, hang on. No, it's the other one, Rosie Jackson. I've got a list in front of me. I'm so sorry. Um, could you please tell us, Rosie Jackson, something about the long history of ekphrastic poetry? Well, that's really putting me on the spot, isn't it? You should have prepared me for this one. I have just got Wikipedia open in front of me to give me a bit of an aid here. So um, the ekphrastic... Um, Ekphrastic art or works, uh, literally the word, it, it's, it's, it's using one form of art in another art form. So in writing, it would be writing that includes 
writing about a work of art. So, so if you've got novels that mention paintings or poems that mention artworks, it's called ekphrastic. Mm -hmm. And um, it tells me on um, Wikipedia that one of the earliest ones is uh, in the Romantic period would be John Keats, his Ode on a Grecian Urn, where he's writing about a piece of art that's that's representing something on the urn. Um, but I think, you know, it's very interesting to me that ekphrastic poetry has become such a popular form in recent years. You know, the, I mean, um, uh, W.H. Auden did that very famous poem about Bruegel's, uh, Bruegel's Icarus falling from the sky, um, Musée des Beaux-Arts, which I think kind of set the, set the bar very high for ekphrastic poems. Um, and, that, and in recent years, there are so many wonderful poems uh, inspired by art. At the Hoban Museum in Bath, we had, um, we had um, a project uh, introduced by Francis Ong King, who runs a lot of uh, workshops at the museum where we write poems about art, um, like the one that Martin Crucifix read. Um, so it's, it's an incredibly... Um, Wonderful. It's a wonderful form because, especially if you're in love with visual arts, as I am, you can marry your love of art and poetry in the same work. So, um, as I said, I did a, a, a book of poems with Graham Birchall that are poems all based on the art and life of Stanley Spencer and his first wife. So, um, it's, it's a wonderful thing because you can literally write about the painting or the image or the photograph, but you can also bring in lots of other details as poets have done tonight, biography, comments. I mean, I thought the, the poem about the, um, the uh, scene on the Titanic was really wonderful to show you. You can look at an image, but you can go in all kinds of different directions with it. So I can't give you a potted history, I'm afraid, but I can say it's a, it's a fabulous, um, it's a fabulous inspiring device to write about images in poetry. And as an artist could write, artists could, Take a, take a poem and turn it into art, which would also be called ekphrastic. Anyway, thank you. Because I think that was brilliant, and you that your notion of taking it a poem in any direction based on a picture was what Martin did, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Martin Crucifix uh, actually took us into that painting mm -hmm. from the. Um, corner image of the blind man. So I wonder, Martin, if you would like to add anything. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can. Can't see you, but we can hear you. <laughs> oh, right. Um, there I am. Thank you. Can I add anything? Um, as I say, Bruegel offers, lends himself to this kind of business uh, very much. I mean, uh, Rose is mentioning there the, the Auden poem, which is, is so wonderful, of course. Mm. Um, there's always um, one of the easy ways into in a kind of ekphrastic um, kind of mode with with a painting is is to make up a backstory really um, and uh, an alternative would be to, to sort of pick a figure as I did and uh, voice their thoughts so you're as you do when you're in a gallery you look around the painting the middle the sides and the artist has created the painting to draw your eye in certain ways um, but if you locate yourself up in the corner of, of a painting, then you see it all very differently um, yeah. indeed, which is what my guy was doing. And of course, one of the great things um, that, that comes out when you do that is you don't know where the poem's going. Mm -hmm. you, you kind of create a character or the character kind of creates itself and, and then it takes you off. And I, I certainly didn't know where that, that poem was, was heading when I, when I began. Thank you. I, if, if I can do a little uh, <laughs> a, a blurb, um, I write it. I write a blog, and one of I think probably the most popular blog post I ever have posted was one about ekphrastic writing and different ways 
into ekphrastic writing. So okay. if, if, if you Google me and, and the blog, you, you could find that quite easily. Thank you. I shall look <laughs> that up. And our next question is going to go to Sarah Westcott. And while Mr. Techie finds Sarah Westcott's picture, I'm going to say I wish I was still teaching English because I would have loved to have known about ekphrastic poems and done them with kids then. <laughs> okay, hi Sarah. Your, your question is, um, which came first, the poem or the picture? And tell us about the links between the two, please. Thanks, Alison. Um, actually, in this case, um, the poem came first and um, I quite like writing on a theme. So if there's a competition or something like that, um, it's quite a good way of honing or focusing your your kind of poems. So this was um, a competition um, for poems about clouds. Um, yeah. So I confess the poem came first, but when I saw the photograph, it just um, married perfectly with the image that I had in my head of looking at clouds from above and that sense of realism um, that you do get in some photographs. Mm, sure. I think um, now, I think, as I said in the chat, they kind of belong together. Even though they yeah, they do. They really, really do. That's why I asked you the question, because I just thought, hmm, I, I don't know here. Sometimes, you know. I think, I think as well, um, with the art that we've been looking at, the, the picture cards and um, Martin's Bruegel art, I think um, it's wonderful to pull out those abstract qualities um, that you might find in a photograph of clouds, whereas with the art, I don't know, I loved Martin's poem and I really like the specifics and the, the humour and the fact that you can be irreverent as well. Um, so you can take the original piece of art and make something completely um, from a different approach. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. Um, I'm just going to pick an a poet and I've picked Chris Hardy uh, for this next uh, question, but you can all sort of join in a bit. Uh, the question is, um, are any of the poets also artists themselves? And that question comes from Joan. Oh, well, I'm certainly not a, I'm certainly not a painter or a, a drawer or anything like that, uh, but I do, I am a musician. Okay. I play guitar and uh, that, of course, is entirely disconnected to this topic. Oh, but I, 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 I have written, I have written ek other ekphrastic poems, and um, the picture library itself is is like a sort of gigantic mine for inspiration. Ah, excellent. Talk a little bit more about that. That's so interesting because some people won't know it at all. Well, you, when you go into it. There's, it's infinite. It's like the universe. There's so much, there's so many topics, so many images, and so many images on individual uh, topics, you know, and uh, there's not really, and this isn't meant as a, a, um, a negative remark, there's no end to it. There's, you can, sit staring in through the website forever. Well, Sounds absolutely great. Um, yeah, I'm going to make a little a little bit of a, an admission here. I used to use those pictures when I was teaching, um, but I won't quite say how I used them because I don't think I was really supposed to, but they were, mm -hmm. I used to go in there and I'd be doing a lesson prep and I'd spend about three hours on one lesson because I'd get so fascinated. Um, I can't remember who, asked this question and um but it's for Vivian Freeman and it's um can Vivian Freeman talk more about the hero of her novel please oh right um yes he uh he's in his 20s um he his father has just died, so he's inherited some money with which he's able to buy a bookshop. And luckily, he meets the heroine of my novel on a day when she could have followed the fate of the rest of her family 
into service, but she meets Leonard Pritchard when he's about to take charge of his new bookshop. And they start talking about poetry. I mean, that's the thing that brings them together. And she does a very bold thing and writes to him and applies for a job at his new bookshop. And he does a very daring thing because he hasn't interviewed her or anything, but just having that talk in the grounds of the big house uh, ensures that he wants Rose as his assistant. And he's a very enlightened man. So the bookshop becomes a sort of talking place, not just for poets, but for um, thinking people in a small market town in the east of England. So, you know, social issues, political issues, and small town life and the larger picture comes into it all. I hope that kind of um, gives you the idea. Of, well, uh, thank you for that. I thought you were going to say a small town in the southwest of England, because that could have been South Milton, where Mark and I and Richard are broadcasting to you from. Very easily. It could be. It could be there. I mean, I didn't want to, although I set it in a place that I knew and I gave it a fictional name, I would like it to be, in a sense, everywhere. So everybody can relate to that small town. Um, Leslie Burt says that your Vivian's book is a great read. The original question came from Linda and Joe Eden wants to know what your book is called. We've obviously got some novel readers here tonight as well. Right. Can you see that? It's uh, called. Yeah, good. Ooh. There it is. The Escape, Escape of Rose Allain. Mm, I like it. That's <laughs> my headline. Yeah, that's a great title. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'm just going to scan a little bit. Uh, oh, I'm just going to scan a little bit to see if there are lots of interesting comments in the chat book, but they're not necessarily questions. So don't think there are any more questions. Oh, there's another endorsement for your book, Vivian. Goodness, you're going to sell lots this evening. Vivian's book is truly wonderful. I think that's some um, high praise. Right, well, everybody, I think that's it for now. We said we'd finish by half past seven, and by my iPhone, it's 7.23. And uh, it's like when you were a teacher and you could let the kids go early. Um, so I, I can say you can go early, but just before you go, please don't forget our next event in which Miss Clara Sharrett, who is 15 years old, will be playing for us live Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, mm -hmm. uh, broadcasting from Bristol with the help of me and Mark and I think Jill Stoker is going to help me as well with it because Mark has got another meeting uh, so you might see Jill and me um, in February and the other thing not to forget please is our Deep Roots Festival online. Arts Destination South Moulton is a small new charity we were going to have an arts festival last year uh, but we couldn't you know why and this year, we're wondering if we're going to be able to have it anyway. So we're going to put it online. And I will be sending out to everybody I can think of uh, details of the festival once we've got it all sorted out. Uh, we're going to have poetry. We're going to have music. We're going to have, we might have dance. We're going to have circus acts. We're going to have uh, visual artists. And it's going to be fabulous. Well, Thank you so very much for coming. If you would like to donate, Mark has very kindly put the details on the screen for you, but also all the donation details are in the email that I sent you um, in the middle of the night, I think, in the middle of last night before I went to bed. Um, we'd love to have some, some donations because we're going to use them towards making our festival next year a ring of roaring success. And with that, dear listeners, dear poets, dear Jill, dear Mark, dear everyone, I'll say cheerio till next time.